Մեծարգով պարոն Վարչապետ, հարգելի գործնկերներ, մերկաներ, մենք սում ենք, կսկարծում եմ աստի ճանաբար ավանդաբարի վերաճով հայկական տլեսագիտական միության կասիրեք պրականի տարեկան համաժողովը։ Մեր կոնվերանսին մասնակտում են հանգատելության տնտեսակիտական և հարող կարությունների ներկայակիշներ, նաև ուսանողներ և զեկութոները, ովքեր ընգրկված են երեկորյան մեր ամաջողովի ուրակարդում։ Ունի մետ առանձնահատկություն այսօրվա կոնվերանսը, հիմնական զեկութ Մասասկյուսեց իտիր տեխնոլոգիական համակսարանի պրովեսը հայտնի մասնակեր աշխատում և այդ զեկությունը լինելու է հերահար կարդով դա առազնասկություն է իս մետն է ընդամենը մետ կոնտերանցի։ Ես սիրով բացմանխոսկի համար Բաղեր ձեզ հարգերի գործինքերներ, առաջի հեղթին ուզում եմ Հայաստանի Հանրաստության կարավալության երանձան դիմանումից ողջունել մի թաժողովի բոլոր մասնակիցներին։ Արդեն այս գիտաժողովը հայկական տնտեսագիտական միության դարնում է ավանդական, մենք ձեզ հետ նյասին անցենք տացնում երոր գիտաժողովը և տեսնում ենք, որ տարեսկարի հետակրությություն այս գիտաժողովի նտացման ավելանում է, ընդլայնվում են շրջանակնե Եվ իտասար գիտնականների ներ գրավել այս զորդ ընթացի մեր և դա շապազանց մի կարևոր է մեզ համար։ Մի հարկի իս առանձնահատուկ նուման այս ամենի չում ունի պահան գրպայանը, որ ես ուզում են նարկալություն հայքներ, այս նախազերնության � առաջյան խանտեղը մեծ ավաշնչյան խաղաքում և որ աղթեն որ մի կերջած հետևողականով են այս գիծը կանում է առաջ։ Մեր մեր ժամանակ որ աղթեն որ մենք բացարիք հինարավորություն այսօր լսելու մի դասախտոսություն մեծ հեղինակություն � շտպելու բոստոն խաղաքում և թնարկել հիմնական թեզերը այն հեպազիտությունների վրնա իրականացնում է և առանք իրենց մեծ անբավ են։ Բերեր համոզված են առդուկ այսօր սանայք մեջ բավականությունը դսելով նրա դ մի հայք կտ ընտեսագիտական մտքի զարգացում Հայաստանի հանրապետությունը։ Նման գիտաժողովները պետք է նպաստեն երի տասարների մոր հետազրկրություն առաջացնելի բարդին ընտեսագիտական հետազրկրությունների նկատմ իրենց հետազոտության արդնքները ներկայացներ նմանատիվ կոնվերանցների դատին և համոզված են, որ եթե բանավեջ տավալվի այդ հետազոտության հիմնական ծեզերի նկատան, դա ինքն ստինքան լրջագույն խթան է, որպեսի երիտասար� ստեղծել այդպիսի միջավայր, այդպիսի մատնալոր, որպեսի մարդիկ մոտիվացված լինեն զվաղվելու հետազոտությունները։ Վենականավար դա նաև պարտավորություն է դնում կարավարության վրան, որպեսի կալպան ձեզ հետ լինի ավելուսեր, և 
mai închei, ce te vei închei, ce te ajută să meri. În tasin e rațiun knerin, e în aravorinus, octagorceng, ai himna ca în garapadnele, vor să te sachet nerin mi-o ciună, te mergi ați mergi da tin. E că vor să închei ca nu e de la nu, vor să rămână ca chit, așa de, ce te naja mai in, așa de, lor asuțici, bafuțunele se fel. Când te sagetneri, am albați în Ierusalim, 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 am albați în ca să cam în pe să ghiți ce nume salisești și ata cea ce dă se vor vom, e vai ori în acea puțiunerea, Poha din vom în ai ori în acea puțiunerea, e da el sti pomet în pe să ghiți ne vin sectori în am agor să fel, al ma să ghiți țiunerii he. Sociologia, oche banuțiun, mascan să așa gând să intă în nevi pe pocuțiun, poha de țiun, e vai. E așa mai ne stipum în mes, în lainel, nu e jos în nasericinerii și în acnele, e am agorsat cel al ghituțunerii, o lor tum, e tot ghituțunerii, 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 E ai în orina și apuțiunei, vă rog, dar se vor rămâne aia asta, nu? Deci, sunt alinerii în tațcom. Vă rog, ca în bar, gol sunt tațcomere, vă rog, fete, ai scarci și rămâne ca hatuațum, mai cancelăm mihanipulerii mișor, e sur, e tot dat să iați scop, porți un mic ascanal, te înșpisi, sunt pe sacan, fiind în sacan, e rebuit nevihete, e în care e mișum, e de la himan, vă rog, zonă în ascanal, te. Nici nu aș mai sta la veneria cele mai încanunate. Și ar fi, nici aș găi în hama drum nereai de te să-i chetiți, am să mai ieși pe nerum, dar se vor vă vorbi în acea puțiunere, în somna seriuțiunere, mers, ochi nume, n-a venit și ești tas canal, mers avans la hat puțiunere, e ai în ori în acea puțiunere, vă rog, ca în ai să-l mergi în somna seriuțiunere, în hama carcom. În zume, în dezvolorit, s-a încanunat pe navor. Așa tang, e o să ne cam cam hava să sume, că vor meni și atunci adic, ne te vei lui valor în semnar cum ne vin, e foarte lui, când s-a mai dasești, avem la examen în cit. Așa că lăsă. Așa, de cuptor, cuta jurul măsă și țărții, tehnologia gândă a măsă a mii, profesor, Tarun, Okay, well, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm uh, sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, it's still a great pleasure to be able to join you uh, from afar, thanks to the advances in information communication technology. I'm going to speak very briefly, just say a few words about uh, uh, my Uh, the, the book I wrote with uh, Jim Robinson on why nations fail, and then open it up for questions, and then take a few questions and uh, and get this uh, dialogue started uh, briefly. Given that uh, it's uh, it's quite late here, uh, I thought uh, we thought uh, David and I thought that would be sort of the best way of uh, getting this dialogue started. So essentially, uh, the reason why I thought I'll talk about why nations fail is first of all that's something I've been thinking a lot about, but it's also I think quite relevant for Armenia, not only just from an academic point of view, but from a, uh, from a point of view of uh, of thinking about uh, you know the challenges that Armenia is facing and, and how these challenges uh, uh, can be turned into opportunities. Essentially, why nations fail is the outcome of about 17 years of research that uh, Jim Robinson and I got engaged in, and uh, and the starting question that. Uh, that, 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 that got us uh, into, onto this journey and here is that, uh, you know, both Jim and I uh, started thinking about uh, various issues in economics, but we felt that 
the most important thing uh, for, for understanding several of the key questions of economics and social science, in particular about why some nations are economically, socially, and politically successful and others aren't, uh, weren't being tackled by uh, the economics as a discipline. So economics was uh, very good at uh, sort of writing down quantitative models and bringing data and, uh, and statistical methods for, uh, for shedding light on these. But the, the most important issue, the politics of economic development, was absent. So, so that led us to write, uh, you know, about two dozen uh, articles and a book, uh, more academic book, over the last 17 years. And then Why Nations Fail is essentially our way of sort of bringing all of this together into a more unifying framework and trying to make it more widely available for a broader public in social science, economics, and, and, and beyond. And so, so the, 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 uh, the title of the book comes from the fact that what we're trying to understand is economic failure. So, you know, why there is a big gap between the, uh, the income of nations uh, was the driving question for Adam Smith when he started writing The Wealth of Nations, which became, of course, the foundations of the economic discipline. Uh, but, but at the time that Adam Smith was writing, the gap between the richest and the poorest nations was of the order of about four or five fold. Today, it's a much wider gap, and and of course, uh, you know, uh, being uh, part of the sort of the Asian economic scene, you know that even just within Asia, there is a huge disparity between living standards. There are some nations that are now approaching the levels of the uh, uh, United States and Western Europe, while others are close to the sort of sub-Saharan African levels of income per capita. So why, why would this be? Or, you know, turning it more sort of uh, concretely, you know, why is it that a country like Armenia, for example, is not as developed as, uh, as we would like it to be? Why is it not following the same path as, uh, say, uh, Italy or, or, or even Poland or, uh, uh, but, uh, but but it's it's still having major economic difficulties, and you know you can you know when you approach a question like that, uh, there are many different perspectives that one can bring, and uh, over the uh, over the centuries, <coughs> social scientists, for example, have talked about such things as uh, uh, as, uh, as say geography. Uh, you know you can argue Armenia is in a it's not geographically well endowed, it doesn't have the right natural resources, it does not have access to sea or big navigable rivers, or it's in a particularly uh, challenging place geographically or geopolitically. And all of these factors are, of course, not trivial. But when you look at the data, there isn't much evidence historically or from statistical analysis that geographic factors are a defining characteristic. Countries have managed to grow very rapidly uh, in the, in the, under the most uh, inhospitable geographic conditions, and, and conversely, a lot of geographic endowments have gone to waste when countries haven't done other things right. Others talk about culture. Perhaps there is some cultural characteristics of uh, Armenia or Azerbaijan or the Turkmenistan that, that sort of makes them not right for growing rapidly. And of course, again, culture, social norms, and things like that are important, and ideas about the importance of values, beliefs, goes back to Max Weber or beyond. Uh, but, but again, empirically, it uh, doesn't seem to be so successful. Instead, what we sort of argue, and that's the one that has both theoretical and empirical foundation, is that what you want to understand if you want to uh, get to the bottom of why some countries are rich and some countries are poor, is you have to think about their incentives what economic, political, and social incentives the inhabitants and politicians and the elite of those nations face. And those incentives are shaped by institutions. Institutions being the sort of the rules, regulations, the arrangements, social arrangements that the societies have. So for example, uh, economic institutions are those that regulate economic activity. We, we draw a distinction between inclusive economic institutions and those are economic arrangements that enforce property rights and enable people to have access to an unbiased judicial system that will uphold their contracts so that they can uh, 
uh, they can exploit economic gains, and most importantly, also creates an economic level playing field such that it's not just a few elites or the privileged, but everybody in society has the ability to participate in economic activity, use their talents appropriately. So inclusive economic institutions achieve two things. They provide opportunities fairly widely in society, and they provide incentives such that these opportunities are utilized. Now, the catch is that most societies throughout history and even today are not ruled by inclusive institutions. They are ruled by what we call extractive economic institutions. And extractive economic institutions are essentially the opposite of inclusive economic institutions. They don't provide secure property rights. They don't provide an unbiased uh, judicial system. Instead, the judicial system is uh, controlled by uh, the politically powerful or the economically powerful. And therefore, you cannot write contracts because you cannot trust the contracts. You cannot con trust the judicial system to uphold it. Property rights aren't secure because you know that when the state or the elite uh, want to grab what you have produced from you or uh, distort things against you, they will be able to do so. And most importantly, again, the level playing the playing field is not level, but it's tilted. It advantages some people at the expense of others. So why is it that societies end up with extractive economic institutions, especially as if, as we argue in the book? extractive economic institutions don't bring long-run economic growth. One idea would be perhaps, you know, uh, some societies by mistake end up with extractive institutions. Perhaps uh, their politicians aren't smart enough and they end up, or they make mistakes and instead of choosing inclusive economic institutions, they choose extractive economic institutions. But in the book, and this is what bulk of the book is devoted to, we argue theoretically, empirically, and historically that that's not the right perspective. Extractive institutions don't arise by mistake, they, ar they arise by design. Extractive economic institutions, even though they don't maximize the growth potential of a nation, they benefit the politically powerful elite. Again, think of the tilted playing field. If the tilted playing field is economically costly, it is so because a large number of people in society are not using their skills, talents, and abilities because they are at the bottom of that tilt. But there is somebody at the top of that tilt, and those are the people who are benefiting from that tilted playing field. So extractive economic institutions emerge and persist when those who will benefit from these extractive economic institutions are politically powerful and are organized enough in order to be able to install them or maintain them. It's when politicians or oligarchs are so powerful that they can adopt a set of economic and political institutions that are beneficial for themselves even if they are costly for society. Now, the situation is much more complicated than that, and, and you know, I'm not going to go into the details, because once these economic and uh, extractive economic institutions are in place, they tend to persist, and when they persist, they take many different forms. But instead, I want to just uh, sort of end by bringing this to the politics of it. So why did I say that politics is central, that thinking about the politics of institutions is so important? Well, if you want to think about that, uh, the simplest way of considering it is by starting with an example. Let's take a, a quintessential example of an extractive institution. That would be slavery. Slavery is one where individuals, a large number of people, don't even have property rights on their own labor. They are totally excluded from uh, many activities. In fact, they are forced to work at very low wages and on the occupations that the slave owners or the plantation owners choose. But how is it that a slave system actually maintains itself? To understand that, let's think of, for instance, the slave society, 17th century Barbados, which actually became a very rich slave society because the slaves were used with large plantations to produce sugar, uh, which was a very valuable commodity. More than 80% of the population were slaves. So the question is, how did the society survive? How did it actually organize itself? And if you, if you look at the details, you see a very interesting pattern. First of all, it, it, this society economically was dominated 
by not just the 20% that were non-slaves, but a much, much smaller fraction of it, the large landowners, the large plantation owners of the Barbados Island. These people were those who were making a lot of money from the export of sugar, and they were the ones who owned the majority of slaves. But how will a society like this survive? And if you, in fact, you look at Barbados, you see that, of course, as you would have suspected, slaves were so willing to work at such low wages and such uh, unsanitary conditions that many of them died before the age of 30 voluntarily. They were forced to do so. There were frequent slave rebellions, and most slaves were convinced to work as slaves because they were forced to do so at gunpoint. So who was doing that coercion? Well, that coercion was done by the security forces or the military of Barbados. And you look at who controlled the military, you see that the top commanders and all of the people who sort of supply the resources came from those few families that were the large landowners, the plantation owners. Who were the judges who uh, resolved disputes and decided whether uh, you know, when a slave ran away or there was a slave revolt or there was a, some contractual disagreement, who was, the right, who was in the right and who was in the wrong? Well, to do that, you look at the top judges on the island, and what you see is that the top judges all came from those few families that, gener that, that owned most of the land on the island. What well, about the politicians, the governors and the top politicians of the island? It turns out they also came from the same family. So this is a very classical case of an oligarchy that was economically and politically powerful, and it was that political power of this uh, set of people that made them economically powerful because their economic power came from the plantation system, from slavery. This we call an extractive political institution. Extractive political institutions because it tends to support the extractive economic institution that I just described. And the extractive political institutions, what it does is that it, is, it creates a particular distribution of political power. It concentrates the distribution of political power and it puts very little constraint on the exercise of that power. And so in the book, we spend a lot of time explaining how these extractive political institutions work, how they create a feedback between extractive economic and political institutions. At the other end of the scale, you have the inclusive economic and political institutions, which tend to support the inclusive economic institutions. And the defining characteristic of the inclusive political institutions is that in contrast to the extractive political institutions, they distribute political power more equally, more broadly, and as part of that process, they also put a lot of constraints on the arbitrary use of the political power by whoever happens to be in power, politicians, elites, or whoever. So bringing the story full scale back, if you want to understand the current economic failures, the current huge gaps that exist, we really have to think about the same concept. Of course, we don't live in the world of slavery, although forced labor is still endemic, especially among some of the Soviet republics, such as former Soviet republics, such as Uzbekistan, for example, but also in Africa, India, and Pakistan. But even if the nature of the economic institutions has changed from the plantation system or has changed from the forced labor system of uh, South America during the French conquistadors, the logic of the extractive economic institutions is the same. And if you want to understand how extractive economic institutions change, and how extractive institutions work, and how they can be changed so that countries that are languishing in poverty <coughs> can, their, can, can get their act together and start growing more rapidly, we have to think of the political dynamics. And, and for that, we have to think, we have to look at inclusive political institutions how a society can change both economic and political institutions at the same time. So if you want to sort of, I am certainly no expert on Armenia, but if I were to sort of look at it from this very bird's eye perspective, I would say that the problem that Armenia has is not geographic, it's not cultural, it's not geopolitical, it's political. It is about fixing its politics, making its politics much more responsive to the wishes of its citizens, so that through that political process, Armenia ceases to be an oligarchy, but becomes a society that provides much broader incentives to the majority of its citizens, so that it can mobilize the considerable potential that it has, rather than letting it go to waste. So I'll stop there and take a few questions uh, uh, that you might have.
Um, we have around 10, 15 minutes for questions. So I'll push from the floor if any questions or comments. Great to go first. Hi, Dylan. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Alexander Kevorkin, in St. John's University right now, at Columbia and NYU. And your book and your papers is something that I assigned to my students to read. So I'm looking Thank you. at the camera. And we discuss it, and I agree overall with your message. But here's a question that I get, and I hope to get here an answer from you. So one is, with the concept of extractive institutions, because it could be interpreted in really broad terms, right? And how do you explain South Korea in that sense? It, it followed exactly that blueprint with oligarchy and extractive institutions and the political mismanagement and so on, yet it's considered a development success case, right? That's one side of the question. And the other is um, looking at the post-socialist transition and uh, Eastern Europe specifically less so post-Soviet Union, but the post-socialist transition in general what we're seeing in um, like Poland, you mentioned Poland, but Romania, Czech Republic, and others, um, granted they have slightly different history, political and economic, but still there's, they shared several things that were in common, including the oligarchy and the uh, special interests and so on. But over time, and historically so in other cases, we've noticed that those institutions evolved, and not necessarily by force. <laughs> it's more of an evolutionary process. So, I get those two questions from students, and I come up with answers in a short time, but, um, and I get away with that. <laughs> but was, maybe you could offer your qualified opinion. Uh, you, know, you mentioned 17 years of research, and, and you must have reviewed those examples, and you must have been asked similar questions. So I would appreciate your comments. Thank you. I think uh, you know, I would first say that 17 years of research is, uh, is, is precisely because, uh, so that we can discover a lot of things that we don't understand. So, I, I cannot give you perfect answers to these questions, but what I would say is that South Korea, uh, as you rightly pointed out, especially right at the time where it split from North Korea, was itself an oligarchic country. Uh, the land distribution was extremely unequal. Uh, not only a few businesses, but a few landowners con dominated everything. But if you, if you compare how South Korea evolved, especially partly because it was trying to get its act together as a, as, a, as a defensive measure against the threat of communism from the north, it became uh, an economy that relied much more on markets and investment. Now, at the early stages, uh, that was still uh, partly, but not fully based on that oligarchic structure. Partly because the, the first thing that South Korea did in the, in the, as, as part of that process was a huge land reform. So, but the tables and the established big businesses played a very important role uh, in the early stages. So, you know, the way that we sort of describe South Korea is in some sense is like China undergoing an extractive growth process where it was getting a few things right economically, but at the same time it was still not a fully inclusive society as you pointed out. But, you know, Part of that, a very important part of that was again political, because South Korea was very far from an inclusive political system. It was non-democratic, the military played a very important role, the chaebols, they weren't as powerful as before, uh, but, but still had huge, huge political power. And, uh, you know, starting in the 1980s, uh, South Korea went through a fundamental political transformation. Uh, the military was set aside, not without major conflict, but the overall outcome was the setting aside of, of South Korea. So at some level, South Korea went through this process where uh, its, 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 its extractive growth led to further institutional change. And I think the evidence is, although you know, I, I'm not sure, the evidence is consistent with the view that if South Korea hadn't actually made that political transition, it would have uh, it would have gotten stuck, and even today, many people in South Korea rightly complain that even though there is the political democracy, there is no economic democracy. Still, large firms play an important role, and there is still more room for more room and more need for structural change, especially sort of for South Korea to go to the next stage of the economic development process. But you know, those are sort of uh, things that I am not an expert on. On the post-communist uh, transition, 
uh, I don't want to take too much of, ta of time, but I think, uh, you know, it's, of course it was a much more complicated process, but I think the most telling thing is, to me, is the contrast between Eastern Europe and the Baltic countries and uh, the, the non-Baltic former Soviet republics. And I think the, 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 the most important aspect of that is that in most of these post-Soviet uh, uh, the republics, what happened is that the transition took a very much of a captured form where the old elites became, remained extremely powerful. And I think it's, it's hard to imagine that that is not somehow related to why uh, you know, all of these countries have had problems, but those problems have been much more severe in the former Soviet republics than in the Baltics or in, in Eastern Europe. So if you think of uh, you know, Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan, I think the picture is very clear. Of course, uh, in some of the other cases, it's, it's a little more complicated, but I think, again, this sort of highlights the ability of a, uh, uh, of, of a political process changing or not changing being a very important factor. Okay, thank you. I have one question, if I may exploit my position. Um, so we learned from your book that um, institutions evolve over time, and that's a slippery road. And we also learned that but, um, there are critical junctures over, over this long term of period to break the mold. So one critical jun juncture in Armenia was the beginning of the 90s and in the post-Soviet space too. My well, question, sorry, but, uh, well, one, well, one critical well, juncture was the beginning of the 90s in, in Armenia. Okay to break the mold and to begin the circle, the vicious circle. And my question is whether we are on the right track and whether, if not, we need another, another juncture. Well, so thank you very much for bringing that, those issues. I mean, those are, as you, uh, as you pointed out, are central to our book, but I did not talk about them. And essentially, uh, the, the idea in one sentence is that, you know, we talk about institutional change taking two forms. It can take a gradual form, uh, and but that's often you know a, a very slow process and can go up or down. But sometimes also there is much faster institutional change when you have a critical juncture taking place. And what we emphasize is that when a critical juncture takes place, there can be a force towards institutional change or for solidifying of the existing system. In particular, when a critical juncture hits many countries, some of them will use that for will be able to use that for uh, for for major institutional change, but in some of them, depending on the existing conditions and how the, uh, how the balance of power is in society, the same process will strengthen subsets of the existing elite and perhaps even strengthen the, uh, the existing system. So one of the examples we give, for example, is the uh, Atlantic trade comes and it strengthens the Spanish crown that benefits and profits from it, but it weakens the uh, English crown when uh, independent merchants are the ones who make the profits from it. So in that sense, I think uh, the critical juncture, the collapse of the Soviet Union, feeds in exactly in the, uh, the, 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 the answer that I was giving, is that uh, the feeding of the, 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 for, the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain, you know, was a critical juncture for all of this area, and, and that critical juncture enabled a difficult but still a positive transition in countries such as you know, Czech, Czech Republic, uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, the Baltic Republics. But in many of the Soviet, former Soviet republics, it, the critical juncture just enabled some subset of the groups, the local communist party bosses or, or, or some, some groups uh, related to them, to declare themselves as the new independence leaders, and then take control of the, uh, the of the system, and in many ways actually act even more kleptocratically than before. Now Armenia is a little different because Armenia has uh, been a, uh, has sort of with some ups and downs, but has been an electoral democracy. But I think on, on the whole, again emphasizing that I am not an expert on Armenia, I would say that Armenia has. Uh, has, has wasted that critical juncture. Armenia has not created as radical a shift with its past and formed the basis of a very healthy institutional growth. So I think Armenia has still a very, very long path ahead of it in strengthening its institutions, but I wouldn't say that 
what it needs is just a, another external critical gesture. I think, uh, you know, the fact that it's a democracy already provides a basis for it that once people are sort of uh, are, are able to sort of analyze the problem and see the roots of the problem, perhaps they can start solving it even without a huge shock like the collapse of the Soviet Union. But again, I am no expert. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. I was curious uh, whether you have any normative arguments about how to change institutions. I understand they evolve, and I understand sometimes there are critical events that can foster things. But are there any conducive developments that uh, we may take on in order to make uh, extracting institutions into inclusive ones? Great question. Unfortunately, uh, the answer is there surely are, but we don't know them. Essentially, you know, the way that we put it sometimes is that at the formula for getting your economics right is quite simple. But the formula for getting your politics right is very complicated because politics is very much context dependent. You know, you can take a country like Egypt and you can say, hey, look, you know, the problem is the military and the Mubarak and then you're going to have, you know, what you should have is something exactly like the Arab Spring. But then you have the Arab Spring and what you see is that Arab Spring brings another uh, dictatorship to power, the sign of the dictatorship of the Muslim Brotherhood. And then in trying to get rid of the dictatorship of the Muslim Brotherhood, you you create even more chaos. So, so you really, the details of that political process matter a lot. And for that reason, a sort of a silver bullet set of recommendations that say, this is how you fix your institutions, this is how you make them more inclusive, is very difficult. So I think what you need to do is a case-based sort of thing and try to get some general lessons. So the, the, the goal that you have to fix the institutions you have to make both economic and political institutions more inclusive, it's quite clear and quite general. But how you get there is very difficult. So what we do in the book is we take the cheap shot and we say, here are a bunch of things that you shouldn't do. These are the pitfalls that you can fall. This is how you can make things worse if you try to engineer prosperity from above, from the outside. This is what you get wrong if you sort of uh, uh, totally ignore the political aspects of it, etc. But But unfortunately, we don't have uh, a very clear set of guidelines about how to include institutions. Whether we will ever have, even after 20 years more work, I'm not entirely sure, but there are certainly a lot of things to work uh, on, and there are a lot of things for us and for others to learn and to discover and to explain here. Thank you. Yeah. It's about 2 a.m. Picture of what our Indian economist looks like at 2 a.m. in the morning. So, <laughs> Very sleepy. <laughs> 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 <laughs